Hi guys, Matt Easton, Scholar Gladiatoria here. So, a topic that receives a lot of attention, uh, both in history books and uh, on the internet and in uh, reenactment and elsewhere, is the subject of bows versus armour. Um, now, this is a huge topic. Um, it's a topic that I've had an interest in for many years. Um, as I grew up doing archery, I used to shoot competitively, and then I moved into um, traditional archery using longbows and uh, uh, Hungarian style recurves and such like. Um, and uh, so I've been involved as an archer for a long time, but of course I've also, since I was uh, very young, been uh, pretty much obsessed with armour. Um, so. And in fact, I wrote my degree dissertation on a certain type of uh, 13th to 14th century armour. So I have had a, a dual uh, interest in both bows and armour. Now this, uh, I won't say it makes me uh, at all unique. I'm sure there's many of you uh, out there who are in a similar position. However, when you read the debates on um, arrows, essentially bows versus armour, you tend to encounter two main types of people. You encounter people who, uh, deep within their hearts, want one or the other to be superior. And this is a problem behind the debate. If you read the published works on, on the subject, you will find that the majority of them um, are either written by people who fundamentally are archers and are interested in the uh, success of the, of the, particularly the longbow, it has to be said, um, or they're people who are very much fans of armour and they're into the more knightly things um, like, like full armour and horses and jousting and such like. Um, so they have vested interests. I would hope that I do not have a vested interest in either party and I honestly don't feel that I do have a particular bias towards one side or the other. However, I have always been interested in the question uh, because it is kind of one of the big unanswered um, points or questions behind history is how precisely were longbows deployed in war uh, during the classic period which was the Hundred Years War between England and France um, so you're talking about the um, essentially from 1340 until 1453 um, and we know for example that during that period England relied very very heavily um, you know sometimes as many as kind of perhaps um, 60 or 70 percent of its soldiery was made up of longbowmen whilst France didn't okay so they were two different types of um, of tactic and there, there's also a prevailing kind of um, thanks to English speaking uh, versions of history and uh, sort of Anglo-American uh, take on history particularly since the First World War that um, English military engine was superior to the French and in actual fact that's a completely short-sighted and simplistic view of it. Um, people always reel off the, the successes of Cressy, Poitiers and Agincourt because they're the famous ones but of course uh, France had many victories, um, especially in the second half of the Hundred Years War, um, uh, and obviously, ultimately, France won the war. Um, and that was due to a lot of factors, both involved with English um, declining commitment, shall we say, to the French effort. Uh, there were increasing uh, political weaknesses, uh, political divisions at home, of course, the beginning of the what became the Hundred Years' War. Um, and, you know, there were economical issues, um, the, the, the Black Death had undoubtedly played a, a part in setting the background to the start of the uh, Hundred Years' War, um, but uh, economic changes in the, after about 1400 also played a part in, in ending it, ultimately. Um, and, of course, the French army changed a lot in that time in itself. Um, the uh, French moved to a much more organised military and much more... Um, uh, centralised and unified military system and of course they introduced the um, use of uh, firearms particularly uh, field artillery uh, or what was then the equivalent of field artillery uh, to a much larger degree than the English did and this was one of the critical uh, factors that really spelled the end of um, English military dominance in certain parts of France. Um, however, so bringing it back to longbows and armour it was never as simple as the fact of long, longbows cancel armour. That never happened. And this is something we have to remember, is that armour uh, became better and better and better during the time that the longbow was in use. Okay? Um, not only did it become necessarily better in protective terms, 
but it became pound for pound more effective. So in other words, uh, by, by the middle of the 15th century you could have a plate armour that weighed less than in the late 14th century but still protected you to the same degree. This is due to both um, improvements in the form of the armour, the way that the plates interact with each other and the way they fit on your body, and indeed due to improvements in the actual um, regularity of production of good quality steel for the armour. Um, so if we look at the 14th century, um, people like um, Alan Williams at the uh, Wallace Collection have analysed, uh, or working for the Wallace Collection, have analysed the metallurgy of armour um, across the uh, late 14th and, and 15th and 16th centuries. And it's very clear that by the middle of the 15th century there were um, more armours available of a very high quality of steel. Um, and in fact some of them were heat treated, particularly in Germany uh, certain, um, and northern Italy, certain um, armours were heat treated in the same way that a sword blade is. And so they were very, very resistive. Um, one of the advantages, of course, to making um, a harder plate, or a better quality steel plate that's more resistant, is that you can actually make it thinner and lighter. And people often don't necessarily think about this in terms of, because they think maybe in terms of things like tanks, and with a tank, because it's powered by an engine and it's on caterpillar tracks, you can just add more and more and more armour to it and add a bigger engine. You cannot do that with a human being. You can't add a bigger engine to, to a human being or give the human stronger legs. Um, the fact is that people can only carry a certain amount of weight and so there's only a certain amount of armour that they can bear. If you can give them lighter armour for the same degree of protection, then you make them a more effective soldier. They can get on and off a horse quicker. If they fall over, they can roll, roll around and get back up quicker. If they're fighting with an opponent, they're quicker, lighter. They'll have longer stamina. They can fight for longer. They can march for longer. They can carry more additional things. If your armour weighs less, you can carry more weapons or carry more food or, or more uh, bedding materials or any of the other things that you would have to carry or might have to carry on campaign. Um, so. Uh, it's a much more complex topic than simply making the armour heavier, thicker and more resistive altogether. Now, the arrows themselves. Um, one of the things to remember is that the majority of arrows being shot at a medieval army are not going to hit heavily armoured people. Okay? The majority of basically any medieval army is not made up of heavily armoured men. It's made up of standard soldiers. And standard soldiers wear things like a padded jack and a brigandine, or a padded jack and a coat of mail. Or, if they're lucky, they have a padded jack, a coat of mail, and a brigandine. Okay? They might have a few plates on their arms and legs, uh, but by and large, arrow wounds are usually only fa fatal if they hit you in the torso or the head. Now, in terms of heads, basically any soldier on a medieval battlefield, or at least let's say 90% of them, would have a helmet. Okay, so everyone's heads are protected to a similar degree, however not their faces. It's, um, it's very noteworthy that the, uh, a few people in the Middle Ages who we know were wounded by arrows, uh, by longbow arrows in this case, were uh, generally hit in the face. The reason for that being that of course a helmet has a face opening, some of them have a visor, but very often you'll raise the visor up because you don't think that you're in danger at that time. If you walk around with the visor down all the time, you will find yourself falling over and walking into things a lot. Visors have very poor visibility in general. So, for example, Henry V was famously wounded in the face uh, by an arrow, by a longbow arrow, and had to have the uh, head extracted by his surgeon. In fact, his surgeon uh, um, invented and uh, had built a specially designed tool to remove the arrowhead from Henry V's face. Henry V had a, a, a gaping scar in one side of his face where the arrow had entered. I think it knocked out a couple of his teeth and you know it was a bad wound and if he'd been a, a less uh, important individual probably that wound would have got infected and he would have died of um, uh, blood poisoning. But as it was he had a good surgeon uh, who extracted the um, arrowhead, presumably cauterized or uh, with alcohol or in some other way made the wound clean enough that it didn't um, separate and it didn't become a, a dangerous infection. Um, so, arrows into, uh, into people's bodies. Um, something that is very often 
overlooked uh, in the discussion of arrows versus armour. Everyone gets into looking at, let's get some armour, let's get some longbowmen, let's shoot at armour. Okay? Um, now, the first thing to remember is that anybody even wearing armour, there are a lot of parts of their body which are not covered by that bit of armour. Okay? So a lot of people like to shoot at breastplates with varying success. There are two problems with that test. Number one, um, that it's usually done at very close range under unscientific, shall we say, or un unhistorical, unlikely conditions. But number two, very often the breastplate doesn't actually really represent what a medieval breastplate would be like. Uh, it's used of the wrong type of steel, um, it's usually the wrong form, it's usually of a uniform thickness, whereas medieval armour is usually thicker in some places and thinner in other places because it's forged. Modern steel is usually rolled off a mill and is therefore of a uniform thickness. So a modern 2mm thick mild steel breastplate is not a fair representation of a real medieval breastplate. A real medieval breastplate will generally be thicker in the middle, thinner at the sides, and won't be mild steel. It will usually be uh, other types of steel, which include, sometimes it can be worse than mild steel, incidentally. I'm not saying it's necessarily better, but it's different. It's a different type of steel to modern steels. Um, now, um, on one hand, we have to say, and this is the underlying context that I want to get to, we have to say in the, in the archery versus armour debate, if one or the other had had a clear advantage, the other one probably would have faded away. Okay? Now, did, did French armies stop wearing armour in the face of English archery? No, they didn't. Equally, the French deployed quite a lot of crossbowmen, some of them French, some of them uh, Genoese mercenaries and such like from the Italian um, state of Genova. Um, did uh, English armies, English men-at-arms, stop wearing armour in the face of crossbowmen? No, they didn't. Okay, so now we take the Hundred Years' War. Hundred Years' War, you've got a force of English against a force of English. For 30 years, they were fighting each other for 30 years. And their tactics did change, and the armies did change a bit over that time. However, not as much as you might think. Um, here we've now got a force of longbowmen versus a force of longbowmen, two large armies with lots of longbowmen, and a small force, relatively small force, of men-at-arms of various types, some of them being like armoured knights, some of them being like billmen and maybe pikemen towards the later period, and so on and so forth. Okay? Did, did those men-at-arms stop wearing armour because of all the longbowmen? No, they didn't. Okay? Next, let's have a look at the Battle of Agincourt, the most famous so-called victory of the longbow. Okay? Marshal Boussicot, who led the French charge at the Battle of Agincourt, was he killed? He led the charge. Okay? So he must have been at the front of the cavalry charge that rode straight down the middle of that kind of funnel towards thousands of English longbowmen, presumably, history would have us believe, frantically loosing off arrows at the French force, probably killing lots of horses, certainly defeating the, the cavalry charge. The cavalry charge doesn't really seem to have achieved much. Um, and this cavalry charge went straight into these thousands of English uh, longbowmen, shooting tens of thousands of um, longbow arrows. Marshal Boussicot, was he wounded by an arrow? We don't know that he was. It certainly doesn't mention he was wounded by an arrow. Was he killed? No. He was taken prisoner. He was taken prisoner? Yes. He got to the English lines. So someone at the front of a French cavalry charge, charging into tens of thousands of English longbow arrows, was, as far as we know, not wounded, and got to the English lines, and was then taken prisoner, and he then lived for about six years afterwards, so presumably he hadn't been badly wounded at all. It, he lived in captivity in, in England, incidentally. So he survived basically all of the arrows that could be shot at him in one of the most famous archery battles of the Middle Ages and seems to have come out of it unscathed. The basic headline here is the best armour that could be bought at that time really, really worked. It worked really, really well. And do you know what? There is not a um, single known historically recorded incident of an individual, a known and named individual, dying from an arrow wound when they were wearing full armour. Okay? The only cases where we know people were wearing armour and they were wounded by an arrow was when they were hit in the face.
Okay, I am not aware of, and I'd be very interested to know if any of the historians out there know of any exceptions to this, because I've, I, I've never seen any. I have never seen a record of an individual who we know was wearing the top level of armour for the time being uh, wounded, fatally or otherwise, by an arrow, unless it was in the face, and therefore there's no armour there. Okay, because they've got the visor up and they're having a drink or talking to someone or they just don't think that the enemy are close enough. Okay, so that's the first thing. The top level of armour really, really worked and we know it did because people at Agincourt were taken prisoner. Remember, Agincourt is the battle, apart from archery being famous for it, it's also famous for Henry V taking lots and lots of prisoners. He took so many prisoners that supposedly he was worried that the prisoners would become too numerous and would essentially rebel and overtake part of his encampment. So he slaughtered the prisoners, which was against the rules of war for the time, and he made, he made the you know, valid excuses for it that he was worried that they were going to become a threat. Um, but the point is, he had taken thousands of prisoners. You don't take prisoners by shooting them dead with longbow arrows. Okay? Ergo, those people had been taken prisoners because they had survived walking through tens of thousands of English arrows. Okay? So it's very, very important to remember when you're talking about arrows penetrating armour that thousands of people, literally thousands of people, walked through English arrow storms and survived. Many of them completely unwounded. Okay? So, that's the first thing. Now you might think, so I'm making an argument here for saying, okay, so maybe Maybe massed archery, maybe longbow arrows, weren't for defeating armour. Maybe they were for something else. Well, as I mentioned, you have to remember that a vast majority of any medieval army isn't wearing the top level of armour. I'm not saying that longbow arrows can't penetrate armour. We know longbow arrows can penetrate armour, and for example, uh, during uh, Foissard's chronicles, of uh, when he's describing the Battle of Poitiers, he says that at the Battle of Poitiers, the English arrows were shot into the flanks of the French force uh, with such power that they even penetrated the sides of some people's visors. Now that tells you a number of things. It tells you that it penetrated armour, perhaps, or does it mean bypass the armour, slip in the gaps? That's possible. But even if we say, OK, let's say it means penetrate armour, Foissart is pointing out that that was an exceptional thing to happen. The fact that it was penetrating the visor and the side of a visor. side of a visor is thinner, of course, than the front of a visor, and a whole visor is thinner than the main part of the helmet or a breastplate. So it's penetrating a thin piece of armor, and that's surprising, okay? So, I do think that arrows did penetrate armor, but not that often. But the more important part is not that much of any medieval army is wearing that much armour. A standard medieval soldier, be it a, you know, someone with a, a bill or, or a spear or um, some kind of missile troop like another longbowman or a crossbowman or someone operating artillery or the standard soldiery, the people who are not knights wearing the best armour, the rest of them are not wearing so much armour. They've got their, their arms and legs exposed, um, they've got their faces exposed. So, you know, a person can take an arrow in the neck and be put out of action, probably die. An arrow in the face, put out of action, probably die. An arrow in the arm or leg, you certainly put out of action. You can't really advance anymore, you drop out, or you fall over and get crushed by people marching over you. Um, so there are many ways to put someone out of action. You don't have to kill them with a instantly fatal arrow through the body or through the brain. Okay. The next point is that we know that in England, longbow arrows were optimised for armour piercing. Um, there's been a lot said about different types of arrowheads and I'll probably do a video about different types of arrowheads in the future because it's a more specialised topic. But it does seem that by the 15th century, the age of full plate, that there was a specific type of, known as a Type 16 arrowhead, that was designed for piercing armour of various kinds. We don't know, could be for penetrating gambesons, could be for penetrating mail, could be for penetrating plate. Remember, even the guy wearing full plate, he still has mail and padding in the gaps. Um, see, sometimes you can hit gaps and put the person down by not penetrating the plate. Um, but we know that Henry V repeatedly complained that arrowheads were being issued to his forces which hadn't been properly hardened. Now, the only reason you want to spend a lot of money and effort and time 
making sure that your arrowheads are made of hard tempered steel is if you're going to penetrate something that's hard okay so we know that arrowheads were optimized for penetrating armor we know that arrows and longbowmen were obviously effective in the middle ages although we don't yet fully understand exactly how they were used and we know on the other hand the armor was generally speaking effective proof against lost longbow arrows people who got wounded with full armor on by an arrow were a tiny minority a tiny minority and they were the exception but we also know the majority of medieval soldiers didn't wear full armor okay so that is i know it's quite long but that is a kind of introduction to the topic we can examine any one of those one points and make a future video about it but i hope it kind of sets the scene and the foundation for future discussions on the topic thank you